All right. Uh, so I was, uh, I get notifications sometimes when new videos come out at me. And so like this one was, uh, came out today from Bitcoin University, 227,000 subscribers, nine and a half uh, thousand people saw this video from 15 hours ago. So uh, I only got 54 seconds in before I thought like, all right, I should make like a, a refutation uh, video about this. So here we go. And the other nine minutes I haven't even seen yet, but this guy just has like so little of a clue that uh, here we go. Let's uh, make sure we have everything uh, covered for everybody here. This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. Today, I want to talk about Bitcoin and big blockheads. In other words, big blockers. So here we are. We're eight seconds in. He already engaged in his first ad hominem attack, calling big blockers big blockheads, right? Like, if you have an argument, make an argument. But name calling is not an argument. And that's something we see over and over and over again from these small block proponents as they resort to name calling and ad hominem attacks. So he's only eight seconds into the video and he already resorted to it. So there you go. Lately, there's been an attempt on Twitter and elsewhere to try to rehabilitate Roger Ver, his failed fork of Bitcoin called Bcash, and his love of big blocks. And so there we go. So he's referring to Bitcoin Cash as Bcash. For those that don't know, that the small blockers that were opposed to Bitcoin being able to be peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world, they went out and intentionally registered at Bcash on Twitter, Bcash subreddit, uh, all the different B, uh, Bcash on Facebook. They registered all the different Bcash social media account IDs within an attempt to rename Bitcoin Cash Bcash so they could already control all the places that people would want for to promote it. They already controlled it so they could use it to attack it. So it was literally part of an orchestrated attack on Bitcoin Cash to rename it Bcash because the people that didn't like Bitcoin Cash already uh, you know, registered all the different domain names and, and uh, user social profiles with Bcash. So like, this guy doesn't know about it, doesn't care about it. Maybe he was part of it, like whatever. But it just shows like, Again, name calling is not an argument. Bitcoin Cash has a name. You can call it by that, calling it Bcash. It's a nice name had it not all been registered by a bunch of people who hate Bitcoin Cash. So uh, I don't know if it's on purpose or will for ignorance from this guy, but just wanted to set the record straight there as well. It's in a blockchain. People who listened to Roger in the past got absolutely wrecked. So that guy has no idea what he's talking about. I was telling people to buy Bitcoin when it was a dollar each. I gave away probably a thousand plus Bitcoin on Facebook back in 2011, you can go and find me posting, say, hey, get the Bitcoin wallet, post your address. Here you go. And so like, it's still on my Facebook profile back in 2011. So people that listen to me made millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, uh, in that. Have they made, have they done as well in Bitcoin Cash as other coins? No, but uh, that doesn't make my arguments invalid as well, right? Like, look, people made a fortune on Enron until that collapsed as well, so. Erect, here's a chart of Bcash versus Bitcoin and BTC is clearly the winner. There's a famous interview here that Roger Ver did with uh, John Carvalho. I'm gonna stop right there. He said, there's a famous interview here. So I wanna talk about John Carvalho. It wasn't an interview. John Carvalho lied to me, contacted me saying he wants to interview me. When I got on the interview, uh, he spent uh, you know about an hour not interviewing me, debating me, but underhandedly doing it like like Borat style when he goes and interviewed somebody famous and says all sorts of stupid things to piss them off. I kept my cool for a whole hour. And then finally, after an hour of him pushing my buttons on purpose, I lost my temper and gave him the middle finger. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just hung up on him right in the beginning when I realized that like, he had values to be under false pretenses. I'm more than happy to debate people on block size stuff and the history of Bitcoin and this and that and Mr. Bitcoin University. I'm happy to debate you on the subject as well. But don't invite me for an interview and then have it secretly become a debate, which is exactly what this guy did. And not just like any debate, like a slimy, insulting, underhanded, like covert uh, debate. So John Carvalho, like, is a should be embarrassed about the way he behaved uh, that day as well. Uh, if he wants to be a comedian, great, go and get, be a comedian. But like, this is something really, really serious. One of the best tools mankind has ever seen to uh, make the world a better place. And John Carvalho is busy in there, like, and. Apparently, it came out afterwards, he already said that he thought he was going to get me to rage quit. So that was his intent from the very beginning, was to push my buttons and get me to rage quit. So like, people love to play like the final two minutes or something where I lost my temper and gave him the middle finger. But that's after something like an hour of him intentionally pushing my buttons. So here we go. In which he rage quit, just to give you an idea of Cheer Roger Bear's personality. So people point at you as, as somebody that would be the... And my personality is that he pushed my buttons for an hour before I finally lost my temper. Continue insulting me. I'm not interested in continuing on this. It's Bitcoin Cash. Get it straight. And if you do that again, I'm going to end the interview because I'm not interested in being insulted. Okay. And noticed I used the word interview there as well, right? Because he told me it was an interview and then it turned out he just wanted to push my buttons as much as he could for the entire time. I'm, I'm promoting Bitcoin Cash. 
The reason that Roger Ver wanted to call it Bitcoin Cash was to rub off some of the glory of Bitcoin onto it. If you say call it Bcash, it just doesn't have the same. So the way the reason this guy calls his channel Bitcoin University is because he wants to rub off some of the glory of being a university. This guy has no understanding of the history of Bitcoin, or he wouldn't be saying silly things like this. Like Bitcoin Cash was ever so close to actually being the actual Bitcoin. And uh, speaking of that, go out and buy my book at hijackingbitcoin.com. Uh, and this Bitcoin University guy should buy that too. Maybe he'll learn a thing or two. Ring. So this end interview ended very badly, as did Roger Ver's fork of Bitcoin, as did the fork of Bcash, which is BSV. Here we can see the company that Roger Ver has kept over the years, Craig Wright, the scam. So I met Calvin, I don't know, maybe five times in my entire life. Met Craig about the same time. I don't even drink alcohol. They asked me to pose for a photo with him holding wine. Like I didn't have a single sip of the wine there. So it's just a propaganda photo that uh, Craig's good. He's a first rate con man, one of the best con men around. He conned me for a while. Calvin Air still seems to be conned by him, but like this was years and years and years ago. So yeah, anyhow, people made a mistake. I made a video years ago saying I was conned by Craig. I feel bad I was conned. Sorry about that. Craig's a liar and a fraud and uh, he conned me. So there you go. How about again? A scammer and Calvin Ayer who financed the whole thing and now Craig Wright's assets have been put under a worldwide freeze. So you have to be very careful the company you keep. All of these big blockers caused a lot of problems for themselves and for their followers. Now here's the Bitcoin blockchain as it exists today as it sounds like it's just a chain of blocks and inside of each of these blocks is a few thousand transactions these are this is the latest block right here these are blocks that are being mined so that's the blockchain this blockchain is downloaded and stored and used by bitcoin nodes which are found all over the world there are about 18,500 reachable nodes and many more that are unreachable and these are spread all over the world and each has their own copy of the blockchain which makes the system very decentralized and very robust. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Clicking that subscribe button really helps. Click the like button, the thumbs up button. Leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future topic. Share this video with a friend or family member. So we have the blockchain, we have nodes. When you set up a Bitcoin node, the first thing that your node does is to download the whole Bitcoin blockchain from the beginning from January 2009. And it goes through and it verifies all of the transactions to make sure that money hasn't been spent twice, for example, the so-called double spending problem. It's very important that regular people all around the world are able to download the whole Bitcoin blockchain in order to run their own nodes and be able to verify all past historical transactions rather than merely trusting someone else to do that for them. So if you read what Satoshi said, he said only big giant businesses would run nodes or only big giant miners would run full nodes. So like he's a Bitcoin university, doesn't know what he's talking about in regards to the original uh, design of Bitcoin to scale to be money for the world. But let's continue and see. And also this is necessary for an individual and a node in order to make Bitcoin transactions directly without needing to trust someone else's node. Oh my God, this guy has no clue about Bitcoin. So there's a thing called the SPV wallet, simple verification uh, protocol, right? Where you don't have to run a full node, right? You can run a light client there and do that. And uh, your funds are completely safe. You can interact directly with Bitcoin. You don't need to trust uh, anybody else there. Like, wow, what uh, Bitcoin, this Mr. Bitcoin University needs to go to Bitcoin University, not run by him to learn a thing or two about Bitcoin. So if you use Bit if you move Bitcoin using Coinbase or Trezor or something like this, you're usually trusting their node instead of using your own node. Now, part of this process includes the IBD, which stands for Initial Blockchain Download. This is constrained by your internet bandwidth. We want to make sure the blockchain is not too big so people in developing countries with slower internet can still download the blockchain. All the people in developing countries time. with the slower internet connections are using custodians, right? So like you had the exact opposite effect here, right? They could have been using real wallets uh, with big block Bitcoin. Uh, but instead they're using custodian accounts. So like, how can you be this blind in 2024 that your small blocks created the exact opposite effect of what you were saying that it was going to? All these people in uh, poor countries are using custodian accounts, not full full nodes or uh, self-custodial wallets. The size of the UTXO set also matters. These are chunks of Bitcoin that haven't been spent yet because this is stored in a node's RAM. So we don't want the UTXO set to get too large. One of the problems with, for example, ordinals and stamps and this, this sort of stuff is that it has bloated the UTXO set as we've spoken about in other videos. Now your node needs to be able to verify every single Bitcoin transaction, as we said, since 2009, make sure there's no double spending, as we said, and also make sure that no consensus rules were violated. And so if the blockchain is too large and the blocks are big, the blockchain is large and there are too many transactions, this could take a very, very long time. So this is another reason that smaller blocks make sense. If but instead, all the people, instead of downloading the entire blockchain and validating everything, they're just using custodian accounts. They're using PayPal and Cash App and things like that. So even if what you said was the goal, 
the res end results were the exact opposite of what the stated goal of the small blockers were. So like you have to judge the policies by the actual results rather than the intentions. And they failed uh, completely with the, the results. If blocks become too big, this begins to penalize those without access to more expensive hardware and internet connections. And if regular Bitcoiners all over the world, we want people to be able to run it in South America and Southeast Asia and Africa, etc. If regular Bitcoiners in these places and elsewhere cannot run a node, then you end up with a situation like Ethereum, where no one runs their own nodes, but everyone chooses instead to outsource node operation to tech companies like Infura. This company, Infura, just so happens to be owned by a co-founder of Ethereum, Joe Lubin, who also controls the MetaMask wallet. No conflicts of interest there, of course. And just like all the P uh, Bitcoin users around the world that are using custodian accounts because the fees are too high because of the small blocks. So like they're all, none of them are running their own nodes. They're all using accounts. So the, the results are the exact opposite of what he says the intentions were with the small blocks. How can you not see that in 2024? This is why it's very important that you don't outsource your node to someone else. This is in Fura. I thought it was funny on the whole. All the Bitcoiners are outsourcing their custodianship of their Bitcoins. So they're not running a node and not holding their Bitcoins themselves. This guy's, how can you be blind to that and ignore that uh, that double standard? Homepage, they call themselves as a company that provides infrastructure for your decentralized application. Well, if your infrastructure is being controlled by a single company, what does that do to the true decentralization of your application? The software may be quote unquote decentralized, but it's running over highly centralized architecture. And when that infrastructure goes down, then it causes a lot of problems as happened in November of 2020 when Infura went down and no one could even figure out how to move their ETH. If the Bitcoin blockchain grows at a faster rate than the underlying hardware capability grows, then it becomes expensive, too expensive, or too technically difficult for regular people all around the world, even in wealthier countries, to run their own Bitcoin nodes. So no one in Ethereum, for example, runs their own node simply because it's so complex. Only the most technically savvy can do this. As I mentioned in yesterday's video, it makes very little sense to force everyone in the world to store and verify a transaction. For example, every time one of my kids gets esteemed milk at Starbucks. These are very small transactions, just a couple bucks, and they're not economically dense transactions. Something like But it was actually the, the point and the goal, and you can read Satoshi's own words, like the goal was for people to be able to use Bitcoin in their daily lives to buy things like uh, Starbucks. So if you don't want people to use Bitcoin for that, you should have started a different project and a different coin rather than hijacking Bitcoin uh, for that. So like the Lightning Network is fine for transactions like this. And for example, that's what Starbucks uses in El Salvador to allow people to pay for coffee. Lightning Network is a layer two solution that uses Bitcoin. It uses the same asset. And this is how money is intended to scale. You have higher layers of money. So you can claim that all day long, but just ask any Lightning user, hey, how can you accept a $5 payment when you're not online or your phone's off, right? They can't. It's impossible with Lightning Network. You have to be online. You have to have be online to do that with Bitcoin on-chain transactions or Bitcoin cash transactions. You don't even have to come online for the next year and you'll still be able to receive your transaction just fine. So money and what happens on those layers, like the Lightning Network, for example, is you batch up transactions, you net them out, and then you settle them on the base layer. You can only imagine how large the Bitcoin blockchain would be if all economic activity took place at the base layer. I think Paul Lamb in a comment from yesterday's video had a very uh, nice analysis of this that I wanted to refer to. According to Paul, uh, Paul writes, according to the World Payments Report 2020 by Capgemini, total non-cash payments globally, in other words, mostly credit cards, I imagine, and, and uh, debit cards, were projected to reach 3 billion transactions per day by the year 2023. To support this scale, blocks would need to be around 5 gigabytes each. Compared to such a scale, there's virtually no difference between current BTC, Bcash, or BSV block sizes because five gigabytes is so large. If your blocks are one, one megabyte or two or eight, there's really no comparison. There's a different order of magnitude. Rendering the Wouldn't it be amazing if Bitcoin captured that much of the world's economy and economic activity? Uh, buying enough storage to store five gigabyte blocks wouldn't even remotely be an issue for any of the businesses involved around Bitcoin if 100% of the world's uh, non-cash transactions were happening on Bitcoin. So this is just... Uh more crazy talk from him. And of course, it would take years to get there as well from where we are. So like five gigabytes today, a little bit big for a home user, but in another decade, that can be very hard for a home user, right? My first hard drive was just a little bit over five megabytes, right? Now you have five, you know, five gigabyte hard drive is small today, right? A five terabyte hard drive is even a bit on the small side for a desktop computer. Ladder 2's initial value proposition moot. In other words, Bcash and BSV have larger block sizes, but they're not nearly large enough to accommodate all the economic activity that would be taking place at the base layer if everything was done at the base layer. To operate at the scale on the base layer, every node on the network would need to download a whopping 5, gig five gigabytes of data approximately every 10 minutes. The blockchain would grow at a rate of 0.7 terabytes per day, meaning today's average home computer would consume its entire storage capacity in under two weeks. It would be utterly prohibitive for the average person to run a full node, meaning that job. And as Satoshi and everybody else early to Bitcoin pointed out, the, the 
configuration, the intended configuration for the future wasn't for home users to be running full nodes, right? It would be, be they'd be run by businesses doing mining and payment processing and that sort of thing. Uh, not your home user on a you know dial-up modem connection in in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll put they literally strangled this technology to bring more economic freedom to the entire world in the hopes that people on slow internet connections in poor countries would be able to run full nodes. Those people aren't running full nodes today anyhow, even with the one megabyte block. So blind. Require trust in that central authority, as we mentioned, for example, Google or Amazon or Infura, by virtually every user of the network. In other words, you'd have to outsource node operation if the blockchain got too large and complicated to use. Increasing block size was never the solution to the scaling problem. Layering was always the way this technology was. Wow, talk about rewriting history. So you can go and read in Satoshi's very own words, 100% for sure, without any doubt. Satoshi, Gavin Andreessen, all the people early to Bitcoin, they, the, the scaling process for Bitcoin was right there on the Bitcoin.org website as well. Go and use the Internet Archive time machine. The the, the method for scaling Bitcoin was to uh, allow the blocks to get just as big as they need to be. So like this guy's lying about history or intentionally lying about it or trying to rewrite it or he was fooled by the other people that already tried to rewrite history. Going to scale. Adoption simply hasn't reached the level to make this obvious to everyone, which allows these ship coiners to fund BTC and pump their bags, people like Roger Bear. So thank you, Paul. That was a great comment. Bigger blocks are a little bit like freeways. It doesn't matter how many lanes you add. The additional lanes will attract more traffic and you'll end up with traffic jams anyway. You could cover LA, Los Angeles completely with freeways and there would still be traffic jams like these freeways. We don't want to live in a world where only Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have the computing power to run a Bitcoin node. So for this reason, keeping the cost and complexity of running a Bitcoin node is extremely important for decentralization and thus for the neutrality of Bitcoin. If only big tech... You can still verify your payments on your own for your own wallet. You just don't need, without running a full node, you just don't need to verify every single transaction in the world uh, payments with your own, you know, light wallet on your phone. Runs nodes, then we're forced to trust them, not only not to lie to us about our Bitcoin transactions, but we're also forced to use whichever version of the Bitcoin software that they decide to run in a soft fork or a hard fork. And that software might include things that are bad for us, but good for big tech. Like replaced by fee. I mean, it's already kind of the case where you have to run whatever software everybody else in the network's running. That's why the, that's how it works. Are good for the government. So don't listen to people like Roger Ver. They've been discredited many years ago and they remain discredited even if they have a new book that they're pushing. Don't fall for the big blockheads and their big block scams. Money is always intended. So there you go. He says, I've been discredited years ago. So like, you can make that claim, but uh, it's not true, right? So like, Clearly, uh, I know what I'm talking about. They're really upset that this book's coming out because it's going to expose all the dirty lies and, and the immoral tactics that were used by the small blockers to censor, silence, and, and coerce the, the people that actually wanted Bitcoin to be money for the world. So please go and uh, buy my book, uh, hijackingbitcoin.com. And, uh, and you can, you know, maybe I'll send a copy of this Bitcoin University guy. You can learn a thing or two because he really got a lot wrong uh, in this video and always has scaled in layers in the gold system on a gold standard in the fiat system and now. Yeah, let's look how the layers for the gold standard, uh, the, the layer and scaling worked out for that. Now there's paper gold for everybody. You don't know what they have in regards to they manipulate the price of gold and silver. Like it really didn't work out well for like scaling uh, gold and silver as money in layers because now there's just a bunch of paper gold and who knows what the actual underlying asset is and where it is and what it exists and what doesn't. So like that didn't work out very well. In the Bitcoin system running on a Bitcoin standard. I'll link in the description notes to this video where I dig a little bit deeper into money and scaling. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know. And if you don't want to be fooled by lying propaganda or people that just plain don't know any better and claim to be running Bitcoin University, go and buy a copy of my book, Hijacking Bitcoin uh, at hijackingbitcoin.com or just search Hijacking Bitcoin uh, on Amazon and you'll have it. And like, uh, man, don't be fooled by the propaganda being put out by like uh, liars like this Bitcoin University guy. There you go. See you guys uh, some other time.